All of a sudden we were surprised by um, the church which was practically next door ringing every single bell they had. For a church to ring every single bell is unusual, especially at night. We were uh, confused, we were bewildered, we said, well, what's going on? We couldn't figure it out. We opened the windows and we realized that other churches in town were ringing their bells and all of a sudden we were really afraid. We thought, my God, there's something going on here. We could see the light on the clouds. We didn't come into clear air until we were over the target. So there was first a glow through the clouds and then suddenly clarity over the target. A cry came from one of the air crew, bloody hell, look at that. Below us was a town well ablaze. The glare followed us back a hundred miles or more. There were many bursts and houses exploded and the flames shot higher and higher and then collapsed. And when it happened again, the woman who stood next to me said that it was my apartment wing. When I looked back and as we stood there, I cannot forget to say it was not just one huge burning wall. It was terrible, and I wouldn't live there anymore. I had lost my home. On the other hand, it was a fascinating sight. The town looked very beautiful, ringed with searchlights and the fires in its heart. They were all different colors. It never struck me as horrible because of its terrible beauty. These voices are voices of experience. The common experience of living through the terror and destruction of the city of Dresden in February of 1945. The bombing left the city, a cultural gem of all of Europe, in ruins. This program will reflect upon and remember the city as it was before the bombing and the rebuilding that has occurred since. This is Alan Young. I'll be your host for Dresden Remembered. She found us sitting near the house, holding on to our only possessions. The family album, the family tree book, our father's unpaid bills, and our school books. But no clothes other than what we were wearing. We were in no mood of playing. Our childhood abruptly ended that night of February 13th, 1945. Dresden's worldwide fame before February 13, 1945, is the result of its cultural heritage of 800 years under the Wettin dynasty. The Wettins, who ruled Saxony from 1144 to 1918, were not only enthusiastic builders, but also shrewd collectors of paintings, etchings, engravings, tapestries, specimens of fine metalwork, porcelain, and instruments. In addition to its status as a center of art and architecture, Dresden boasted an illustrious reputation as a center of secular and sacred music. Dresden's wide boulevards, open market spaces, fountains, gardens, and charming narrow side streets, coupled with its position along the broad Elba River and fantastic skyline of towers, turrets, domes, and steeples, drew writers and artists for centuries. Observers such as Goethe, Schiller, Herder, and writers of the 20th century praised its aesthetic delights. For 300 years, the city landscape was captured by artists, most notably Canaletto. Lastly, Dresden was a city of education. There was a technical university, numerous academies for art, dance, and theater. On the night of February 13, 1945, in the town of Altenburg, Ilse Pilger had settled down with a book, carrying out her self-imposed Drahtfunk duty by keeping one ear cocked to the radio for the first indication that Allied planes were approaching. After a while, she dozed off, 
only to be awakened by an announcement that large formations of Allied aircraft were heading east. An air raid was expected. Ilsa and her family were lucky that night. The bombers were heading not for Altenburg, but for Dresden. At exactly 10.03 p.m., 276 British bombers appeared over Dresden and began dropping high explosive and incendiary bombs on the heart of the Baroque city. In the next 14 hours, two succeeding waves of bombers, including 300 American planes in the final wave, assaulted Dresden. The city's cellars and shelters were transformed into deadly ovens with temperatures of more than 1,000 degrees Fahrenheit. The question since that night has been, why Dresden, a city of no recognized strategic targets? The answer is because of the objectives of the bomber campaign. They had two objectives. One was the destruction of German industry and war production, and the other one was the destruction of German civilian morale. Tom Collier teaches military history at the University of Michigan. He also taught at West Point while he served in the Army. And the Dresden campaign was specifically directed at morale, not war production. In the summer of 1944, when the Allies felt they were winning the war, they discussed an operation called Thunderclap, which would shock the German civilians and their leadership into understanding that they had lost the war. The armies were continuing to fight, but they felt Thunderclap might be able to turn around German willingness to support the war. Thunderclap was to be a series of bombings on the unbombed cities of the eastern portion of Germany, Leipzig, Chemnitz, Dresden, and particularly Berlin. So were all of these cities actually bombed? The event was that in the summer of 1944, the German army stiffened so that the Allies realized that they were a long ways from winning the war. Mm -hmm. And Thunderclap was not called out into effect until the winter of 1945, January of 45. At that time, the um, Allied command again thought they were in a position where if they could knock the German support for the war out, they could, not, they could end the war. And Thunderclap was ordered executed with Berlin as the first target. Berlin was struck in early February, and Dresden was the next target on the list. Mm. They waited for the moon and the weather, and they struck on the night of the 13th of February. Considering the, uh, the power that uh, Hitler and Nazi Germany had over the people, do you think it was really necessary to destroy any morale that might have been left? The question of destroying civilian morale in any state mm -hmm. um, is a myth of the air power enthusiasts. It didn't work in China in the 1930s. It didn't work in England in the early 40s. It didn't work in Germany or Japan in the later 40s. It has never worked. But it's a myth that's there. It sounds wonderful. If we could just make those people stop supporting the war, mm. we'd end it. Always what happens is the civilian population simply digs in. The Germans had an expression, our walls are broken, but not our hearts. Mm. And they continued to resist. A mine had landed on our street and had dug a deep hole up to the wall of our living room. Hildegard Walter is a retired journalist, still living in Dresden. This air pressure had caused the windows in the living room and in the rest of the building to burst, but the greatest force of the pressure had gone into the opposite direction. Because the bricks on our sidewalk had flown over the opposite lying building and they were now lying in the garden. The residents from this house, who saw this huge crater from the bomb, had feared that if the pressure had been in our direction, that our lungs would have burst. This was quite possible, and it happened frequently. Houses burned in our neighborhood, and the curtains, which were fluttering through the broken windows, had to be torn down so they wouldn't catch fire and cause fires within the houses themselves. We were still occupied with doing that when we heard from far away sirens, and simultaneously the second wave of bombs started to fall. In blind fear, without grabbing our air raid shelter equipment, we ran to our basement and experienced for a second time what I have since called the entrance chamber to hell. This was a terrible inferno. As this also was passed, when we were back in our apartments, we saw the people whose houses had been hit fleeing in terror and fear through the streets, running in a panic-stricken state, and they were running towards the Elbe River to its banks, which were about 15 minutes from our house. 
since signs had been put out throughout the city that in case of an air raid, people would take refuge in the great gardens along the banks of the Elba River. Days later, we heard what great tragedies had taken place there. People who were engulfed in flames had run into the water, and when, on the 14th of February, at noon, the next attack came, it was a dive bomber attack, and it must have been this way. They aimed with machine guns at the fleeing people on the road while they were diving. I just know that the banks of the Elba River were seeded, were sprayed with fire bombs, and if a person were anywhere near, he was hit, burst in flames, and was buried there. The attack on a civilian population, the attack on a city, which had no war production, no war industry, at least not large enough anyway, to be even mildly interesting, which was well known in England and America to be bursting with refugees from Silesia, which had people from all over running from the Red Army in the Dresden Main Railroad Station. People were camped there temporarily, of course, sheltered for the night, there on the night of the 13th, who were going to be moving on the next day. None of them made it out in this night. All died a horrible death. And what it meant on the 14th of February, when we came out, out of our shelters, that is, onto the streets filled with smoke and a firestorm. There was no more oxygen, one thought. It was like a hurricane were blasting through the city, and there was a total lack of oxygen, which had brought on this terrible firestorm. An older couple, who I knew, their house had been bombed, and now they were going back to find some remains of it. They were carrying some of their things, and they had linked arms because it was hard to walk. The man let go of his wife, set down his suitcase, was going to rearrange his suitcase, and when he let go of her and he turned around, his wife was gone. She had been blown away by the wind. She was never found again. Hildegard Walter a retired journalist still living in Dresden. The key thing about the city of Dresden was that it was a virgin city in terms of bombing. In the fall of 1944, the suburbs were bombed very lightly, but the city of Dresden was literally untouched until the winter of 1945. In addition, the war on the Eastern Front was moving in the direction of Berlin and Dresden. And so Berlin, Dresden, Magdeburg, Chemnitz, and those cities became key communication centers for German troops moving to the front. That's the only military justification. But really the key was that it was a German city, major city, well known, and never been touched. We asked Tom Collier which countries were involved in the bombing of Dresden. The American 8th Air Force and the British Royal Air Force were the countries that actually conducted the Dresden raid. The entire bombing of Germany was called Operation Point Blank, which was a combined operation of the British Royal Air Force, the American Air Force, American Army Air Force as it was specifically at that time. And so Thunderclap and the bombing of Dresden was a subordinate operation to that overall Operation Point Blank, the bombing of Germany. And again, war production and morale were the two targets. In Dresden, it was, it was the city, the morale of the, of the German people that was the target. It unfolds chronologically back in 1945, the war lurching towards a close, but in the winter of 45, the Germans again show surprising strength, and the Allies are frustrated, and uh, so they order point-blank executed. And the actual operation itself begins at 10.03 p.m. Dresden time when the first bomb falls in the old city. By the next night, 24 hours later, the city was a smoking ruin with a bare minimum of 40,000 civilians killed. Really, it's in many ways a parable of the 20th century and the Second World War, where our very great progress in technology ends up in massive destruction on a scale we've never, never seen before. The first attack comes at 10.03 p.m., uh, with night bombers of the Royal Air Force, 276 of them, dropping over 800 tons of mixed incendiaries and high-explosive bombs with fair accuracy. The Royal Air Force, in its own technical terms, considered it a moderate success. Three hours later, however, 
529 more British night bombers dropped over 1,800 tons of bombs on Dresden. And the combination of a very clear sky, complete lack of German fighter attack, and the fires started by the earlier attack allowed very high accuracy. And as a matter of fact, the Royal Air Force considers this the most successful single night raid of the bombing campaign. It effectively destroyed the city. Ten hours later, in daylight, 311 American B-17 bombers appeared over Dresden, guided by a pillar of smoke which they could see over 100 miles from the target. As they approached the target, they realized that the target was completely covered with smoke. They could see none of their aiming points, and they simply dropped their bombs into the smoke. 771 more tons then came crashing down through the smoke on the city. The Americans returned on the 15th of February and again on the 2nd of March to bomb the old city and particularly the suburban areas where actually most of the military targets were in Dresden. Uh, but in fact, on those time, those two raids, there was really very little left to bomb. I must begin with the previous afternoon. I lived in the vicinity of Saxony Square and worked in the outskirts of the city. Anna Marie Temo is a retired dentist. She gives us this eyewitness account of the events of February 13, 1945. Every day I rode to the place where I could look at the silhouette of the city by the Elbe. Each time I looked, I asked myself, will you see the silhouette again? And then that day, Tuesday, February 13, was especially nice weather, mild air, spring-like, and I thought, will you see this all again? It's so pretty. And then I went home, as normal. 21.45, at night, alarm. We had at previous times been in the basement. We had a deep, sturdy basement, and I was really, the atmosphere wasn't really fearful at first. We talked down there, but then we noticed something was wrong. Though we did not really hear the bombs, it was so solid, the basement, I mean, until someone went out now and then and reported what was going on and finally told us the city was being bombed. Then, all of a sudden, we were giving the all-clear signal, and we went up, and our house stood, and from the window, I saw how, maybe 250 meters toward it, the city was burning. We organized our room upstairs, Mom and I, so we could sleep. Then, another alarm was sounded, but different. We heard later uh, that the sirens had been broken. Some of the sounds were made, so we went down again. And this time we heard more. They came closer. First the inner city was bombed, more, and then they went east and bombed our section of the city. It went a while, can't tell how long, and we noticed that our house was also burning, and we tried to get out. One person wanted to stay. He said we had to go through the fire and that beams were falling. I said, so what? We had to get out. So I went down to the Elbe. The river banks was the closest free field, and it was not far away. To where the place where we had to go. It was quite below the river bank street, maybe 15 meters. And there, when I really got down there, I had this experience which I will never forget. We noticed that the planes had come and had in their dives a simple shot at the park officials, and they lay there, corpses. I quickly guided my mum a little further down, and then we stood with the others, who had also come down to the river, and stood and watched the houses burn. One part of me felt it was terrible, and I wouldn't live there any more. I had lost my home. On the other hand, it was a fascinating sight. 
this long stretch of burning houses. I watched, and as we stood there, I cannot forget to say it was not just one huge burning wall. There were many bursts, and houses exploded, and the flames shot higher and higher, and then collapsed. And when it happened again, the woman who stood next to me said, but it was my apartment wing. When I look back, these experiences were most unreasonable. And I left Mom here in a basement doorway and went further to Blazowitz and tried to stay with friends. We went to more friends, but they already had taken many in. Some coming from different situations, some were whining, others said nothing, and were totally quiet and in shock. For some days, more air raids continued, and more people were complaining. Then my mother, who was then 74 years old, talked. She cajoled them. See, reason, she said. Relax. Accept this. With all the complaints, that won't help. At this time, there was little talk of revenge or hate. I got a few things. Nothing from the government except the coat. And then, of course, on the 7th of May, the Russians came and everything was forgotten. And we only concentrated on the Russians and what they did to us. Anna Marie Tamel, a retired dentist still living in Dresden, with her first hand account of the events of February 13, 1945. They wanted the war ended before the attack. That was the mood, completely anti-Hitler. Anna-Marie Schubert was a secretary in 1945 at the Technical University of Dresden. We heard about the attacks on Berlin. God only knew when Dresden's turn would come. We were always worried. We, my sister and I, listened constantly to the London radio station. We had a receiver. Blankets were hung over it so that no one would hear it, and the reports from London came in the evenings. I knew the station signal. The station would always indicate when a German city would be bombed. They'd say, Berlin is a beautiful city, Berlin is a beautiful city, or Hanover is a beautiful city. When that was said, the city would be attacked the next day. It was strange, however, that we never heard that about Dresden. It began in the evening at 9.45. We heard a terrible noise and crash, and we saw, of course, what we called the Christmas tree from the sky. So it appeared. Then a phosphorus bomb struck our house, broke at an angle into the highest floor of our building. We, of course, fled immediately into the cellar, but first tried to throw the important things out of the window. We lived on the first floor. We threw out some bedding and the sewing machine, pictures and rugs. Whatever we could save, we threw out of the house. We waited in the cellar until another bomb hit the basement. Everything was burning, and we had to leave immediately. We were close to a park right next to the Grosse Garten, and I with my sister jumped over a fence into the Grosse Garten, holding mattresses over our heads because everything was burning. The trees in the park were on fire. A large hospital near us, full of wounded soldiers, was also hit. There were long lines of soldiers, some in night clothes, some on crutches. They moved past us in a long procession. It was terrible. 
Many people sought refuge directly in the Grossegarten. We sat down on the edge of the park. Unfortunately, many died there. Nearby was the zoo. All the animals there, the lions and other animals, roamed the garden. Yes, these are images one can never forget. It cuts very deeply. We sat until the next morning in the street. We thought the bombing was over. There was only smoke and agony left. Next morning, we returned to our house. We were able to pull a handcart from the cellar. We packed up what little we were able to save into the wagon. Then, with the cart, we walked along the stupid alley. We were caught up in the alley's strafing attack there. At noon, the low-flying planes came. It was terrible. We saw the pilots in their planes equipped with machine guns to shoot people in the streets. It was horrendous. That was at noon. We were lucky to come through this alive. Then, with a handcart, we proceeded towards Pirna. We continued farther until we reached a small village where we lived with friends until May. The train station in Dresden was entirely destroyed. We made our way over ruins. There were no more streetcars either. It took a long time to rebuild. Dresden was a field of rubble. Afterwards, for many years, I found the New Year's Eve fireworks horrifying, and the first summer when storms came, the lightning and thunder reminded me of that night. During this attack on the main train station, thousands of refugees from Pommern and Schlesien, all these people were there. Many of them died, in thousands of innocent victims. This is true for the whole war. One can simply say it made no sense. Anna Marie Schubert was a secretary in 1945 at the Technical University in Dresden. mentioned the old city versus the new city and actually used the phrase military targets. Was there any strategic military reason to bomb the city? And if so, why didn't they go for that area first? The answer is yes and no. Um, the strategic reason given at the time, actually briefed to the bomber crews, was that Dresden was a transportation center in which Germany was moving reinforcements up to fight the Red Army, which was not far away on the Eastern Front. In addition, Dresden was packed with refugees. And the idea of disrupting the control of these cities by attacking cities packed with refugees was also briefed to the crews, so they understood that there were many civilians in the city. Actual military targets, however, there were none, and the crews were briefed to drop the lead bomb simply in the center of the old city of Dresden. No military targets were ever designated for this attack on Dresden. Tom, you have some... Uh first-hand accounts from some of the, the pilots or the uh, the airmen that flew over? Yes, the British air crews in the, in the second wave in particular that were flying in on the, on the flame of the first attack uh, three hours earlier. Uh, here's one description, quote, we could see the light on the clouds. We didn't come into clear air until we were over the target. So there was first a glow through the clouds and then suddenly clarity over the target. A cry came from one of the air crew, bloody hell, look at that. Below us was a town well ablaze. The glare followed us back a hundred miles or more. And then another airman describing after the fact what he had seen, quote, the town looked very beautiful, ringed with searchlights and the fires in its heart. They were all different colors. It never struck me as horrible because of its terrible beauty, close quote. Now, you're not just a history teacher, you also have a military background, so uh, what goes through the mind of, of a serviceman when they're doing something like that, where they're following their orders, and yet something inside of them tells them that this is, this is terrible? I think you can generalize as far as air crews are concerned. Once they deliver the bombs, they're, they're getting out of there. They're, the, the job is over, and they do not think they do not see, they can't physically see, and they do not think about what's happening. Here, let me give you a, a quote. The bombardier is speaking, quote, Bomb doors open, left, left, steady, bombs away. Let's go home and get the hell out of here, close quote. That's it. Mm -hmm. 
and the visions of what happens on the ground they may see later in photographs uh, but they never physically see it at all and for them it's a survival exercise let's get the hell out of here She had just come back from this trip to get some family heirlooms or possessions which she'd stored away with a farmer in the countryside and she'd passed these streams of refugees and she got back to the city about 9 or 10 in the evening. Bruce Borthwick is professor of political science at Albion College. His great aunt, Margaret Link, survived the bombing of Dresden. And as she tells me, she was carrying these uh, suitcases up the stairs of her home and just as she got the last suitcase up a flight of stairs, she heard the air raid sirens, and she said, well, this is just another practice, because they'd had several air raid drills during the war, mm -hmm. but this time it was not a practice, it was for real. The motor is humming evenly. The gauge of the speedometer moves between 60 and 70. At this speed, Dresden will be reached in 20 minutes. Then I will lock the heavy suitcases up the stairs, the same ones I had hauled down the stairs half a year ago to get far away from the city into rural isolation and supposed safety. Back then, many were moving their belongings. A carried-away psychosis had broken out. At that time, suitcases could be seen everywhere, just like now, but the picture has shifted. To be safe now means returning to the city with all of one's belongings because the Russians have crossed the banks of the Oder and Neisse. Then military transports had passed the little car which was traveling east. Now the car is passing endless convoys of refugees coming from the east, seeking safety within the walls of Dresden. The center for refugees recently counted more than 400,000 homeless persons. Even all the schoolhouses cannot accommodate them all. Most public buildings are filled with these poorest of the poor, sleeping on bags filled with straw. And tomorrow I will once again pull duty at the field kitchen, passing out portion after portion, looking into desperate faces, trying to console the homeless. Tomorrow I will... Oh, damn it all, the alarm is sounding. The car is supposed to stop immediately. Defiantly, I step on the gas pedal. My garage is just around the corner. The streets are pitch dark. The beam of low light catches a number of children, strangely dressed. Oh, of course. Today is Fushing Tuesday. They trip over the long skirts they found in grandmother's old trunk. Their amusement should not be spoiled. As soon as the last suitcase is brought into the apartment, the warning broadcast reports, Alarm level one, heavy bomber squadrons are approaching the city. Well then, once again down into the cellar. Heavy bomber squadrons? Quickly a bite of food is taken, helmet put on, and old mother taken by the arm. Just then, people come in from the street. Breathlessly, they report, This time it's serious. Christmas trees all over the sky. Many, everywhere. And then, all hell breaks loose. An inferno has been loosened over Dresden. Death. The hiss of falling bombs cuts through the air. Hollow-sounding detonations shake the earth. The little group of humanity sitting there in the air raid shelter for the first time is aware of its helplessness vis-à-vis -vis such devil's work. No one complains. The house vibrates. The house shakes in its foundation. How long before it will collapse on top of us? Thank God the vaulted cellar withdaws the air pressure. Crashing and splintering above our heads. Then the horror starts all over again. Two, three, four times. One ducks, one holds on tightly to the hand of a loved one. The emergency light has died, and so, too, has courage. No one yet can imagine what it means to be underneath the rubble. No one yet has an incline about the extent of destruction of an entire city. One prays, but no one else needs to hear. Lord, have mercy on us. Lord, spare us. Lord, deliver us from the evil. Does this give strength? Does it give hope? Oh, yes. Continued detonations without interruption. Unceasing explosions for 40 minutes. An eternity. Finally, just as the slow, ebbing rumbling of a thunderstorm, which is moving out of the area, so too the crashing and splinting slowly comes to an end. The people in the cellar dare to take a deep breath. Someone from above called down, Careful, the staircase is destroyed. Use the emergency exit. The house survived. Thank God, we all still have a roof over our head. 
This night ought to be pitch black. This night is bright as day. A sea of fire all around. Choking smoke gets into the lungs. Houses are fiercely ablaze. Trees look like burning torches. Sparks are flying. Walls are collapsing. People are screaming. Dante's Inferno could only be a foretaste to this horrifying gruesomeness. First, to find a place for the old people, warning them, don't look around, just watch your step so you won't stumble. The image of Sodom and Gomorrah comes to mind when Lot's wife turned around to see the burning city and was turned into a pillar of salt. Indeed, just like today, what a miracle that one is able to bear all this. And the old people, they shut themselves off from what is going on around them. Yet this was only the beginning of the death throes of a city with a population of one million. The way back to the house is strewn with ruin and destruction. But I must get through. Crash! Right in front of me a wall collapsed and comes down. My helmet is hit by some of its bursting stones. Good helmet. Finally I made it. The house door is gone. The broken wall is like an open wound. Windows, doors, stoves, gone as if they had never been there. But in the back of the garden lies that door, undamaged. The blast threw it over twenty meters. Sparks catch the torn grapes on fire. They are torn down and stepped on. Get water. The bathtub water is gone. The fixtures torn off. Pipes hanging there crookedly. The same in the kitchen. At least the cupboard withstood the assault. Everything out, carried into the garden. But stop, what is this? Little whitish blue flames are dancing on the lawn. The grass is burning. The bushes are burning. Someone is screaming phosphorus. It is running down the side of the house. Phosphorus cannot be extinguished. My God, what is that terrible sound in the air? Are these devils returning? Has there not been enough murder? Again the dreadful hiss of the falling bombs cuts through the air. The sound of motors. One wants to cover one's ears. And there are the first detonations. Again the earth trembles, walls shake, houses crumble, burning thousands of children, women and old people underneath. No one of them had ever pointed a weapon against their enemy. Get into any cellar, any dark hole, human bodies pressing against each other, darkest night all about, the horror of it all constricts one's breath. One ducks down like an animal facing the unavoidable. Not a sound is made, only once in a while a soft whimper can be heard. Nerves are stretched to the point of bursting. Earth is bursting. Is this just as horrible as the inferno just suffered a while ago in one's own cellar? How long ago was that? At least one could hold mother's hand and felt the fear of this loved one as one's own heart beat. No, that was not as bad as this is now. During those few hours of respite, one had already seen too much of the horror, heard from too many who had escaped the churning cauldron of the burning city. One cannot hope to escape alive. One shuts oneself off from reality. How many hours are spent sitting there? Shouldn't it be morning by now? What kind of a morning? Would the sun shine? What kind of a day? Someone whispers, it's Ash Wednesday. My God, has there ever been a more horrible one? Where might mother be? Towards five o'clock I finally find her. It's a miracle that all these old people in that burning house are saved. A small wagon loaded with beds is standing there. Where might its owner be? Property without an owner, heaven send, so that an exhausted eighty-three-year-old might rest for a little while. The heat coming from the city, a first like a storm and now like a full-blown hurricane, the flying sparks which are grasping and finding their victims, all are unbearable. Torrents of people, blackened by smoke, are hurrying towards the forest. Wet blankets are on their shoulders, handkerchiefs pressed on their mouth, strange looks in their eyes. An endless column of misery, of wretchedness, this horde of escapees from death, beaten creatures. The stream of homeless pours into the suburbs which suffered less destruction. Doors open willingly for first aid, first shelter, first food, first relief from extreme need. A thick, heavy cloud of smoke lies heavily over the city, is the sun shining above it? But its rays are unable to penetrate this black wall of death, this satanic work of men, placed between heaven and earth. A pallid, eerie light illuminates this scene of horror. Those Christmas trees of the previous night, those murderous torches, illumine an area of 15 square kilometers. The carpet of bombs laid down by Anglo-American Air Force annihilated this area so thoroughly that not one house is left standing. Within a few hours, a once flourishing city was reduced to rubble and ashes. This city was once considered among Europe's most beautiful, the Florence on the Elbe. The walk through smoking and burning ruins lasted many, many hours. Everywhere efforts were made to identify the dead. Heart-rending scenarios took place. 
in the inner city efforts are underway to recover the dead from the cellars, where these tiny black bodies once human beings, two of them would fit into a child's coffin. The heat of the fire has mummified them. Coffins? They are not enough for such a large number of dead. It is impossible to identify these remains. Many disintegrate into dust at the slightest touch. Warning, danger of epidemic. These dead must be burned as soon as possible. There are mounds of these horrible human remains. Soldiers are working with shovels. Instead of an air raid shelter, the city fathers had built a giant water basin right at the side of the old market so that in case of emergency, the fire department could pump the needed water. That was the intent, but the firefighters never reached it. Though they had courageously taken off right into the burning inferno, the heat of the burning asphalt scorched through the tires of the vehicles and the men's asbestos suits were no protection against the men's heat. Not one of them survived. Hundreds of people had jumped into the large water basin located in the heart of the city because their clothes were on fire. They suffered two thoughts of dress. The water was drained from the basin which was turned in an open air crematory. Flame flowers did a fast thorough job. For many days a sickly sweet smell polluted the air, reaching all the way to the suburbs. The ashes were collected and solemnly interred at the Heldig Cemetery located at the edge of a murdered city. Cleanup efforts continued for many months. The shroud of silence hung about for many years. The horror in the hearts and minds of the survivors can never be erased. An eyewitness account of the destruction of Dresden by Margarete Lenk, written before she died in 1972, presented by Angela Reek. Did the Allied forces suffer any losses in the attack? Actually, there, there were heavy losses in the RAF night bomber force. It took one of the heaviest losses of the war, but not at Dresden. The anti-aircraft guns had all been moved to the front, and uh, so it was a, essentially a free ride, uh, the attack on Dresden. At what point were the Germans aware that this was occurring? When the first bomb hit, or was there no. any warning? No, the Germans had an elaborate air, air warning system, and they plotted the uh, the Allied bomber streams coming in from England and uh, had a, a system of uh, moving their fighter aircraft around. This particular night, they, they were fooled by some of the decoy attacks. David Irving uh, describes it in detail in his book on Dresden, uh, and there was almost no fighter attack. Were sirens going off to warn the general population? The radio warnings, which the Germans normally broadcast nationally, were all for either Magdeburg or Chemnitz, not for Dresden. Dresden did not get the ra uh, warning until the uh, planes were actually heard and sighted. Even if they had been warned, is there anything they... any? family could have done to escape uh, what happened? Well, the German air raid precaution system was elaborate, uh, shelters, warnings, uh, that was very effective. But once the firestorm was ignited in Dresden, there was no protection. And in Kurt Vonnegut's book, Slaughterhouse-Five, he describes the air raid shelters, which were either stacked with corpses who had been suffocated from the flames, soaking up the, uh, absorbing all the oxygen in the air, died of suffocation. And in many cases, according to his book, and I can't testify for it physically, the bodies actually melted by the intense heat. So there was kind of a sloppy slime in the bottom of the air raid shelter, and that was the people. Mm -hmm. So there was essentially no escape uh, in Dresden. What about uh, city officials and uh, people like that? Were they able to escape? Um, yes, many did, and, and in fact the German bureaucracy functioned uh, throughout the war, uh, including the, the Dresden account. The, the German police administration for, for Dresden was responsible for trying, for instance, to uh, compute the casualties, which they eventually gave up on, on the grounds that they just couldn't find the evidence. But yes, some of the city officials did survive, whether they were in the suburbs at the time of the attack, the suburbs were not attacked, or sp on some particular shelter that survived, I don't know. but. The bureaucracy, the city administration did survive and continued to try to rescue over it. But just to give you an example, I read that there were 17, actually 17 hearses in the city of Dresden to carry dead bodies. Fourteen of them were destroyed in, in the bombing. Mm. So it's that kind of total catastrophe where all services 
are destroyed. Nothing is left. And they actually remove the corpses by bringing the local farmers in with their wagons and horses and loading the wagons with corpses and taking them out to the nearby cemetery. Mm -hmm. A technique that the German air raid uh, precautions people, the police use, was to remove wedding rings, which in Germany normally have the name or at least the initials of the couple engraved inside. They had somewhere between 20 and 30,000 wedding rings collected in buckets after the raid, so to give mm. you an example. The problem of the uh, uh, sanitation in the city became great. And in, uh, in March, the weather turned warm, and the city stank so bad from the corpses that it was commented on frequently. It was the Tuesday before Ash Wednesday, the height of the carnival season sticks out in my memory because it was a clear, sunny winter day without snow and we children were able to play our favorite games out on the streets all day long. The following accounts of the events of February 13, 1945 are from Jürgen von Strauwitz, a member of a distinguished Dresden family. In retrospect, I believe that government people were aware of the possibility of air raids because on that same day, all citizens assigned to rescue operations were called to meetings to make sure everybody understood their duties. Our father was part of the rescue teams. This happened on February 13th. He had to report to his station by 9 p.m. My sister, then age 13, had to work that evening at the railroad station, helping war refugees, fleeing the Russians, with their belongings to find the various trains they were supposed to take out of the city. When word came of an impending attack, all young helpers at the railroad station were sent home. My mother, who was supervisor of the shelter in the basement of our house, had earlier been called to a drill session. That meant we twin boys and our young housekeeper were at home by ourselves as the air raids began. As we had practiced before, we got dressed in a hurry, took the suitcases, which were always packed before our parents left to report to their stations, put our helmets on, slipped a hand through the harness of the gas mask, and went down to the shelter. Shortly afterwards, our mother and sister arrived in the shelter. Now our family was together, except for our father. After a few minutes, we could hear the first bombs explode. The light in the shelter went out, and I could hear the despair in the voices of the approximately 25 people gathered. Dust and smell of fire seeped into the shelter, and after a powerful explosion nearby, a woman called hysterically to her husband to open the connecting door so they could flee into the next building. All buildings with common shelter walls were supposed to have a fireproof steel door in the wall so people could flee from shelter to shelter in case one building received a direct hit and started burning. For whatever reason, few buildings actually had the doors installed. Instead, loose bricks were stacked into the openings, a situation which proved fatal to many buildings, for fire could spread through these openings from building to building. We removed the bricks in the opening of our shelter after we found fire approaching from above, but smoke came through the opening from the adjoining building. We fled in panic through the first floor of our house into the street. There we realized that our house was not on fire, but the small shoe factory behind us. The factory received a direct hit, which set all the flammable supplies like glue, wooden leather, drying racks, etc. on fire. My mother suggested that all of us should try to reach a small park nearby because she felt it would be safer there than among the houses. We children started to run in the direction of the park and after a short distance I noticed that my mother was missing. Later I learned that she went back into our shelter to make sure everybody had left. Sure enough, a 84-year-old lady was still there, in tears, because she was too weak to leave the shelter. My mother assisted the lady and both made it safely up into the street. We children together with our housekeeper ran along the street for about 600 feet when we were stopped by a huge pile of burning rubble blocking the street. The rubble came from a house which had received a direct hit and sparks were still flying all over. We turned around and started running back towards our house. In the meantime, a coal warehouse near our house was burning out of control. 
The flames were fed by wind and the air turbulence, which is prevalent when a city is on fire. The red-hot coal dust was blowing across the street, but we had to make it through. In the confusion, we lost my brother, but kept on running along the Fürstenstraße towards the park. We had previously agreed to meet at a certain spot near the pond in the park. When we arrived, my twin brother was already there. We huddled close together near some bushes, and all of a sudden we heard the air raid sirens go off again. By now, it was about 1.45 a.m. We laid ourselves flat on the ground because we could already hear the approaching planes. The second air raid started just like the first one. First came the spotter planes. Next came planes which dropped illuminating canisters to light up the city or what was left of it. Next came the bombers. We could clearly see a wave of detonating bombs approaching us. Among the bombs were phosphorus canisters, which, when they hit the ground, exploded into high-density flames. We could see trees go up in flames like fireworks. That wave of destruction was coming towards us fast, but miraculously stopped about 30 feet short of us. A short distance past us, in the flight direction, it started up again. Just a few minutes before, one bomb holding chamber in the plane must have emptied, and it must have taken the pilots a couple of seconds to switch over to the next one. That saved our lives. We waited until the air raid seemed over and went on further towards the outskirts of the city. In a near suburb, we climbed onto the bed of a truck and fell asleep. In the early morning hours, we took a cart from an open garage we passed and loaded our suitcases and rucksack on it. Before leaving, we pinned a note up on the wall of the garage promising the return of the cart. So on we went, pulling the cart behind us. After a while, we crossed the River Elbe and came by a pharmacy, whose owner was kind enough to give us some sandwiches to eat. By now, it was past mid-morning on a clear and sunny February 14th. The only clouds in the sky were the smoke clouds from our city. Suddenly, we heard approaching planes again. We figured them to be dive bombers, which we assumed would shoot at us if they could see us out in the open. We abandoned our cart and crawled into nearby concrete drain pipes. From our hideout, we could see the industrial area outside the city of Dresden being attacked by the planes, and we could see the smokestacks of the factories crumble. After the attacks were over, we left our hideout and hurried along the road. In Königstein, we took our cart and kept on going towards the town where our housekeeper's parents lived. We crossed the river Elbe again, came by a bakery and were given some bread. We had no idea if our parents survived the attacks, and our parents had no idea if we were still alive. Later, we learned that our mother and the elderly lady survived the attacks and tried to make their way to the field hospital where my father was on duty. On the way there, my mother helped to put out a fire in a single-family home. That house is still there today. My father experienced nothing but horror all through the night also, but at least they were alive. After my parents had something to eat, my mother set out to try to find us. It must have been a terrible search. For every corpse of a child she came upon, she turned it over, examined the shoes or socks to find out if it was one of her children. After three days of searching and after asking all the relatives for signs of us, she thought that the only possibility left was the house of our housekeeper's parents. Since all public transportation and phone service was destroyed, she borrowed a bicycle and took off to the town of Bad Schandau, about 26 miles away, and the hope to find us there. As she arrived at the house where she hoped to find us and encountered silence, her hopes were dashed. She expected us children to run around frolicking, now that we would be in relative safety. She found us sitting near the house, holding on to our only possessions. The family album, the family tree book, our father's unpaid bills, and our school books. But no clothes other than what we were wearing. We learned that an aunt and uncle and three cousins also perished. 
we were in no mood of playing. Our childhood abruptly ended that night of February 13th, 1945. Jürgen von Strauwitz, a member of a distinguished Dresden family. This is Dresden Remembered, a program commemorating the elegant Baroque city destroyed by an Allied bombing attack in February of 1945. I'm Alan Young. In part two of the program, we'll discuss recent developments in the city, including the rebuilding of the Frauenkirche, the best-known landmark before the bombing. We'll also speak with art historian Elizabeth Thoburn about various architectural and artistic losses that occurred, and we'll also examine the long process of healing. As far as blame goes, it's a, it is in fact an interesting, an interesting consequence to Dresden and Thunderclap and the uh, bombing raids on German civilian morale in general. Tom Collier teaches history at the University of Michigan in Ann Arbor. When questioned about the, the problem of guilt for the Dresden raid, uh, Air Marshal Arthur Harris whose nickname is Bomber Harris, and that gives you some idea of his enthusiasm for the campaign he was waging. When asked about the, specifically about the guilt on the attack on, for the attack on Dresden, he said, quote, the feeling such as there is can easily be explained by any psychiatrist. It's connected with German bands and Dresden shepherdesses. Actually, Dresden was a mass of munitions works, an intact government center, and a key transportation center to the east. It is now none of those things. In fact, it never was any of those things. It was not a key transportation center or any of the other things that he mentions. And he dismisses it in terms of German bands and German shepherdesses as if it were inconsequential, the destruction of Dresden. Harris never repented in any way. On the other hand, Harris was never uh, appointed to the House of Lords. And the Bomber Command is the only major command in the British Armed Forces which did not receive a specific medal commemorating its service during the Second World War. Winston Churchill personally backed away from responsibility for the destruction of Dresden, which he was instrumental in ordering initially. And in his own memoirs, he says in one sentence something to the effect that in February, Dresden was bombed, period. Tom Collier teaches at the University of Michigan in Ann Arbor, where he specializes in military history. But I will never forget the day because I moved on February 13th. Elizabeth Thoburn, currently a resident of Ann Arbor, Michigan, lived in Dresden for 10 years from 1976 to 1986. She teaches art history at Washtenaw Community College in Ann Arbor. What happened was that, of course, when you move, you think about moving in all kinds of details and you don't exactly think about a war date. I knew mm -hmm. that uh, Dresden had been bombed, but I was a teenager and I wasn't... You know, that was not my first thought, and what, whether it was the 13th or not. But that night, I remember being in our new home, and uh, our family was unpacking, making plans for the next day. And at 
started when the original bombing happened, all of a sudden we were surprised by um, the church, which was practically next door, ringing every single bell they had. That was uh, an amazing uh, thing that happened because in Germany, um, every church, depending on how rich they are, have a set of bells. But there's a wedding bell and there's a bell for funerals and there's there are a few bells for Christmas and for joyous occasions and so forth. So for a church to ring every single bell is unusual, especially at night. We were like taken by surprise. We were uh, confused. We were bewildered. We said, well, what's going on? We couldn't figure it out. We opened the windows and we realized that other churches in town were ringing their bells and all of a sudden we were really afraid. We thought, my God, maybe that must be an emergency. There's something going on here. So before we found out what was going on from neighbors, there were at least 10 minutes where we were confused and in a way reenacting a little bit of the f feelings that I think people had years before. So when we found out that it was the um, commemoration of the bombing, my brother and I decided to walk through town to the center of town, which is the uh, Frauenkirche, the church um, that was heavily bombed. And, and we saw many, many people out there walking around the city with candles and putting candles on that memorial. So that was, um, to me, the initiation to Dresden and also a very um, memorable night. I mean, that was, that was something I, I hadn't expected and we were all taken by surprise, but it was a real um, powerful moment, a powerful evening. Many losses occurred on an individual or almost accidental basis. The destruction of Dresden in 1945 also meant the crippling of the city's progressive artistic community. Many studio of Dresden artists were completely destroyed during the bombing. Examples for artists who lost their whole life's work were Wilhelm Rudolf, Theodor Rosenhauer, Berger Bergner, Hans Theo Richter, Willi Jans, Böckstiegel, Hans Körner, and I'm sure there were more. One of the most famous private art galleries of Dresden, the uh, Gallery Kühl, was bombed out that night, and with it the earlier works by an important Dresden artist, Ernst Hassebrauck, who at the time was showing a survey of all his early works. One artist, Wilhelm Rudolf, who had lost his whole artistic output in that one fateful night, went out to sketch and draw the city like in a mania. For months he roamed the desolated streets of his hometown and captured the inferno. He describes the city after the disaster as follows. The light of the dawn of February 14, 1945, merely illuminated glowing, smoldering ruins of the Elbe, where Dresden had been the day before. Long spikes of fire licked at the ruined facades, sucking out the last bits of oxygen from every hole and crevice. The asphalt, which had melted and become sticky in the heat of the flames, mercilessly held on to shoes of those who were attempting to flee death. Months later, I still kept finding these witnesses of that deadly night, again and again, the shoes of women and children. Elizabeth Thoburn, a former resident of the city of Dresden, currently teaching art history in Ann Arbor. The most important artist to capture the destruction of the city on the 13th of February is Wilhelm Rudolph. Hans Ulrich Lehmann, curator of the Graphic Arts Collection in Dresden. He started immediately, that is a few days, after the 13th of February to wander through the city, the center of which was totally destroyed. He began to sketch the street scenes and individual homes so that by the 8th of May, the day of capitulation, or as we used to say, the day of liberation, he had completed 50 sketches. He then continued to sketch so that by the spring of 1946, over 150 sketches were completed. The lifeless streets with only the hollow facades of ruins, the mounds of rubble, find themselves captured in an ambitionless, almost surly sketch manner of short strokes. The grim destruction, 
the wounds of the war that were turned back on Germany and that are captured in this manner made the sketches the most impressive artistic document to the downfall of the city in 1945. Besides the sketches of Wilhelm Rudolph, one should mention the painting The Death of Dresden by Wilhelm Lachnitz, a pieta that is a mother with her child on her lap that sits among very expressive and piercing pieces of rubble, columns, and bomb fragments, totally absorbed and, of course, devastated. The painting by Wilhelm Lachnitz, originating at the end of 1945, beginning of 1946, and the sketches of Wilhelm Rudolph are perhaps the most essential and impressive art simply because they show directly the destruction of the city. Besides this, the destruction of Dresden was repeatedly the subject for many artists in the 50s and 60s. This may be due in part to the character of the city. She was not called the Florence on the Elbe and the Florence of the North for nothing. This may perhaps be simply because of the outstanding buildings of centuries that were preserved here in Dresden until February of 1945. This was due to the efforts of the electors of Saxony and sometime Polish kings. Augustus the Strong was also king of Poland. They left their mark on the city through a number of outstanding art collections. Art and culture, including theater and music, played an extremely important role until the advent of the Nazis, so that many artists and people interested in culture were extremely shocked by the great destruction of the city. Ernst Hassebrauch created a series of dry points during the years 1947 and 1948 in which he worked more strongly and reflectively concerning the death of the city. Later, at the end of the 40s and the beginning of the 50s, there is a whole series of painters, among them again Wilhelm Rudolph, that once more captured the terror and ruins of the city. But I have to say that these pictures, through their picturesque conception, have represented a landscape of ruins almost in an antique sense. However, in the sketches of Wilhelm Rudolph that were done immediately after the destruction, the immediacy and the fear and terror as elements of destruction speak in a more direct way. We are going to exhibit for three weeks in February some of the sketches as part of the 50th anniversary. It's like this. Wilhelm Rudolph assembled 150 of the sketches into a cycle he called the Destroyed Dresden. These 150 sketches were acquired in 1959 by the Graphic Arts Collection of the State Art Collection, naturally with the restriction that we exhibit them occasionally but they are absolutely impressive works of art without any propagandistic elements. They are simply impressive. And that is for me the lasting and artistic outcome. I would compare them with the drawings of Henry Moore, the shelter drawings that were drawn during the German attacks on London, and with a sculpture by Osip Satkin of Rotterdam of the figure whose heart is being torn out. There also an artist has captured the terror of war in a forceful form. For me, that would be the most important and notable result. Hans Ulrich Lehmann, curator of the Graphic Arts Collection in Dresden. In terms of the portable art treasures of Dresden, precautions had been taken during the beginning of the war. Elizabeth Thoburn tells us about the fate of some of the art collections amassed in Dresden over the centuries. By 1940, most of the Dresden art treasures had been brought to nearby mines and castles. In some instances, these locations were rather fancy and even included air conditioning. In other instances, they were less adequate and caused some losses through moisture, but most of all to theft and looting. A substantial portion of art was lost actually after the war when Russians confiscated just about everything they felt like. Many of these confiscated pieces were returned during the 1950s, but there are still a number of pieces um, about several thousands, I guess, which have vanished from the face of the earth for the time being. Perhaps some of them will surface in a major upcoming exhibition in Moscow early this spring, which will feature World War II spoils, which until recently had been kept a closely guarded Russian government secret. Naturally, the attack caused bad wounds for the art collections connected to the 11 museums of the city. For the graphic arts collection, the losses due to the immediate consequences of the war were not severe. There were only a few large format works left in the palace that were burned during the attack. The graphic arts collection had been housed since 1940 in bomb-proof cellars in bedrock at Wesenstein Castle, complete with climate control, so that till 1944 there was still a normal study room, 
one could announce oneself there in Dresden, although one had to wait a day while the articles were brought from Weisenstein to Dresden. The collection, as I was told by the old curator who was in charge during the 50s and 60s, was not immediately saved, as we used to say, by the Russians on May 8, 1945. In fact, the guard detail of eight men under the command of a major sought to make contact with the Russians on their own after they had heard that Germany had capitulated. The Russians came then on the 10th or 11th of May. The German guard detail stayed there till the Russian Trophy Commission got there. Then the approximately 450,000 pages were brought to Pilnitz Pavilion. This was the main assembly point where the Trophy Commission of the Red Army brought together all art treasures. The gallery was destroyed as well as everything else. And that's where the Trophy Commission decided to transport almost everything to Russia. About 25,000 pages remained here after the Russians removed the rest. Losses to the collection are on the order of 15,000 pages. Among these, about... My God, what is that number now? I estimate about 5,000 pages of drawings are worked up in their own catalog of losses and published in 1988-89. It was possible in the last few years to regain about 50 pages through various means. Some were given back to us by other collections. Others were offered to us at reasonable prices to be purchased. The last significant group to be reacquired were six drawings by Mensel. It can be seen through the 50 regained works that apparently during transport from Dresden Pilnitz to Moscow and Kiev, where the collection was housed, complete groups of works were designated to be stolen. It's not for nothing that, for example, 20 sketches by Dürer are missing, about 25 pages by Kate Kolwitz are missing, and about 25, previously 30, sketches by Menzel. These were all highly regarded artists by the Russian authorities. After we become aware that one of these works is somewhere on the art market or has reappeared somewhere, and one backtracks the root of the work, then it most often points back to Russian emigrants. It's, however, the case that the entire library of the collection, which until the war was administered jointly with the library of the Gemelde Gallery, or Gallery of Paintings of Old Masters, as a single library, is, as before, being held back in Russia. There are also some other parts of the library that are being held back. In these cases, perhaps through difficult negotiations, a solution must be found. More serious losses had to be borne by the Gemelde Gallery or the Gallery of Paintings of Old Masters, because their storage depots were scattered over large parts of Saxony. With the advance of the Eastern Front and the Red Army, emergency evacuations were planned. A couple of furniture vans full of paintings wound up being parked on the Brülsche Terrasse on the 13th of February that were naturally burned up during the attack. Other things were plundered in the various storage places or were in other ways destroyed as a result of fighting. In this case, also, the essential things were transported to Russia in 1945 by the Trophy Commission. During the negotiations for their return in 1955, as the first group of paintings came back from Russia, it always dealt with works of art and not the libraries and also not with archival materials. This is the case not just with Dresden, but with everything that was within the boundaries of the Russian zone of occupation. There are considerable groups and holdings in the various collections and storage places around Moscow. I can't say what's where. There are commissions of experts from the foreign ministry that are now negotiating with the Russian government. But as we know, whether it's Schliemann's Trojan treasure or other missing collections, the Russians can be difficult about relinquishing anything. It may take a long time before they do. As I said, in 1955, the first group of paintings were returned. They were then exhibited in Dresden the following year. Then, in 1958, the essential parts of the other collections were brought back. The collections of sculptures, the Grüne Gewölbe, or treasure vaults, the historic arms collection of August the Strong and his ancestors, and also the graphic arts collection. Since 1959, the graphic arts collection also reassumed its old name, Kupferstich Kabinett. Till that point, the first post-war director, Wolfgang Walza, had given it the more modest name of graphic collection, since a 25,000-page collection was considered too small to deserve the original title. 
We can't say exactly how many pages we have, but it is somewhere between 420 and 450,000 pages. With that, we are, after Berlin, the second largest graphic collection in Germany. What is even more interesting, we are the second oldest in the whole world. The oldest graphic collection is in Paris. August the Strong, using the Parisian example, started this second independent collection in 1720, and that makes us very proud. Hans Ulrich Lehmann, telling us about the fate of some of the art collections amassed in Dresden over the centuries, and the history of the graphic arts collection in Dresden, where he is the curator. The city of Paris has the Eiffel Tower. Rome has St. Peter's. In London, Big Ben sits aloft the Westminster Palace, which houses the Houses of Parliament. Most cities boast a major building that represents much of what the city stands for. For Dresden, that building had to be the Frauenkirche, the Church of Our Lady. The Frauenkirche withstood the initial bombing on the 13th of February, 1945, but the church collapsed on itself after film that was stored in its basement caught fire due to the immense heat. The combination of internal fire, heat, and pressure caused the inevitable destruction of the city's prized architectural gem. A recent development and controversy has been the rebuilding of the Frauenkirche. Some say the rubble should be left as a reminder of the destructive powers of war. That is my personal opinion. I mean, mm -hmm. I did never see the uh, Frauenkirche in its original state, so to me, it is hard to see the loss of it. Elizabeth Thoburn is an art historian and a former resident of the city of Dresden. What I see is that it was a dramatic memorial that I came across that very first night I was in Dresden, and I saw how people responded to it with candles remembering the atrocities of the war. And to me, that is an important fact. The outer um, walls of the ruins are standing, then inside and around it there is a heap of gravel, but it is a secure ruin. And right in front of the uh, main entrance there was a memorial with Martin Luther on. And Martin Luther toppled down that night, but um, he, he just had to be put up again. So you now have that um, site, or you did, until they started rebuilding. You had uh, the uh, memorial with Martin Luther against the silhouette of the Frauenkirche, and that was a dramatic view. Yeah. And to me, that should always be there to remind generations to come of what happened in Dresden. And I have seen um, cities in West Germany where uh, rebuilding efforts started right after the war, much more th so than in the East, where now you would come to a city where you know it had been destroyed during the war and you find just no evidence anymore. They're beautiful. They're, the, the paint looks like it has been put on yesterday. The, the streets are clean. It's, it's, they're gems of, of cities, but there's no evidence that there ever has been a destruction. And to me, that doesn't seem right. Well, there are plenty of reminders of the bombing elsewhere in Dresden, all these gaps and all these buildings that are still not there. Bruce Borthwick is a professor of political science at Albion College and a member of the Society for the Rebuilding of the Frauenkirche. He says that rebuilding the Frauenkirche will help heal remaining wounds of the war. The Frauenkirche stood there from 1945 until 1990 as an open wound. And as long as it was not being rebuilt, this wound was open and unhealed and that one of the fundamental Christian beliefs is to bring about reconciliation and to heal wounds, so that the wound, shall we say, should be closed and it should be rebuilt and it should be a sign of reconciliation, uh, particularly among peoples. What do you say to the, uh, to the other point of view that, that says uh, the Frauenkirche was a memorial to, uh, to a terrible thing, a terrible thing in war, and that it should have been left as the rubble to uh, to remind us of that, acknowledging the the aspect of healing things. 
How do you answer also the, the aspect of remembering things? They're going to take the old stones, which are now black because of the fires, and use them where possible. And then many of the old stones have been so weakened by the fire that they can't be reused in the building process, so they're going to be thrown out, and they're going to be replaced with new stones. And these new stones are a stark white. So when I was in Dresden this past um, August and observed the initial rebuilding, just to the very, very lower level, you see these bright, bright white stones, and then right next to it is a dark, dark black stone. Mm. So you'll always know that this is a church that uh, is rebuilt and that has gone through this horrible um, death, and we might say resurrection. When I get angry about the stone heap, then I will always remember that at this place, the war that came out of Germany struck back. Hans Ulrich Lehmann, the curator of the Graphic Arts Collection in Dresden, says that although the destruction of the Frauenkirche and the city of Dresden was unnecessary, these losses were rooted in Germany's aggression. As I regard the developments in Germany, such a tangled stone heap, which was the Frauenkirche till three years ago, is literally a stumbling block or a stone of offense, scandal, and anger. And this memento mori, reminder of death function, that is the reminder that once from a big-mouthed Germany a war went out that covered all of Europe, that function will be lost. Even though there will be white stones, new ones, and black stones, old ones, one might think it will look like a zebra, I fear that once the church is reconstructed, this reminding function about the guilt that Germany has to assume, if it will be so evident to the populace because they will then not have to deal with it in such a direct manner. This is where my doubt comes from. It is why I have now a more critical outlook, but in principle it is correct that the Frauenkirche is being rebuilt. It is also my hope that the surrounding areas that now are open parks or building sites and that once were the historic center of the old city will also be rebuilt in a historic manner. I furthermore hope that it won't become a Disneyland, but that it will be a place where normal people can live at normal prices. The way things are at the moment, I fear that in 10 years, if prices continue as they are now, Dresden will lose its inhabitants because no one will be able to afford to live there. But that's another problem that we will have to deal with. They're trying to make the rebuilding of a Frauenkirche a sign of reconciliation and that the war is essentially over with and that the Americans and the British who bombed the city of Dresden are now also helping in its rebuilding. Bruce Borthwick, professor of political science at Albion College. And one symbol of this is that the cross, which once was on the top of the Frauenkirche, and it's about 12 feet high, has been dug out of the rubble, and this cross is going to be regilded, or the gold is going to be put back on it by people from Coventry. The Frauenkirche was built between the years of 1726 and 1743. Reconstruction began in 1990, with the hope of completion by the year 2006, when Dresden will celebrate the 800th anniversary of its founding. We've discussed the rich cultural history of Dresden. We've heard first-hand accounts of the city's destruction in 1945 and some of the efforts at reconstruction. What is Dresden now, and what is it becoming? Johann Gottfried Herder is a famous poet or writer, and he actually called Dresden the German Florence. It would never occur to anybody today to call Dresden the German Florence, and I think that, is, that tells you a little bit about how it changed character. Mm -hmm. Also, every German city, in a way, has a heart. You have a market square where things are centered. Often you have a fountain or a little park, and you have a city hall, you have a church. Um, things are centered around the market, and Dresden has no market square anymore. It's like it's a city without a heart, it's a city without a center. It is now just spread out, but you don't have that one point to which everything leads. Is there a, a feeling of hope in the city now in, in any general way? Yeah, I think after unification it became clear very quickly that Dresden would become one of the main cultural centers of Eastern Germany again, like Leipzig or um, East Berlin. Dresden will have a great chance and 
as I said before, if you fly over Dresden today, you see probably 500 cranes. You see new businesses. People are really um, starting new and starting all over again. As residents of the city of Dresden continue their efforts at rebuilding, questions will no doubt remain regarding the night of February 13, 1945. I think one thing that is important is the historical context. That is to say, today in peacetime, looking back at Dresden, seeing the catalog of, of artworks that were destroyed, the terrible casualty tolls, it just seems incredible that such a thing could have happened. At the time it happened, it's important to remember, it was hardly noticed by the Allies. It was just another city. The brutality of the war, back and forth on both sides, not only bombing but uh, genocidal treatments of populations, um, had reached the point where the destruction of one of the key art centers of the Western world was hardly even mentioned, hardly even noticed at the time. And what that shows me is the brutalizing process of war. Once you start it, there's no telling where it's going to end. It is really quite natural that one was after the 13th of February in the weeks and the months after that one was filled with hatred hatred for the English hatred for the Americans who had brought so much suffering to the city and its inhabitants but like everything in life things change with time the attitude towards these things change the war was over the truth about what we Germans had done to other peoples became known we know nothing during the war, at least we didn't surmise it in all of its harshness and horror. What in the name of Germany had happened in the concentration camps and the prison of war camps to the thousands upon thousands of people. How the civilian populations of Poland and Russia had been treated. That didn't become known until after the war, in bits and in pieces. And with that knowledge, my attitude towards the Americans and the English changed. Those whose planes had really only followed an order, who had to carry out the command. The originators of this gruesome bombardment were just like those of ours in Germany, the military and the politicians. They did it. And I find it totally repulsive if I today, 50 years later, were to have a negative attitude towards the American or to the English people. That's over. The wounds of this war, chiefly those garnered in Europe, these are healed, scarred over, but I must confess that on the 13th of February of each year, when the bells toll in remembrance, then the wounds, they begin very slowly to break open, but they only hurt. But hatred, no, that doesn't come forth. That is gone. Forever. This has been Dresden Remembered a program commemorating the events of February 13, 1945, when the city of Dresden was destroyed by Allied bombs. The historical commentaries were provided by Tom Collier, who teaches at the University of Michigan, Elizabeth Thoburn, an art historian at Washtenaw Community College in Ann Arbor, and a former resident of Dresden, and Bruce Borthwick, professor of political science at Albion College. Our sincere thanks to Ulla Rolt, Hans Stahl, Helmut Schick and Melina Williams for providing the translations and for their readings. Thanks also to Margareta Reich, Angela Rieck, and Barbara Zöllner. We had production help from Helmut Schick, and special thanks to Frank Williams, who conducted on-site interviews in Germany and who provided the impetus for this program. Dresden Remembered was produced in the studios of WUOM in Ann Arbor, this is Alan Young.